So good day, everyone. It's nice to be here in this way, um, sharing the Dharma, sharing the practice, and sharing maybe our care for each other. So today I want to uh, begin by making a distinction in Buddhism between what can be called practice and what can be called training. Uh, The word for practice, bhavana, can also mean cultivation, development of something. And we practice mindfulness to develop mindfulness. We practice concentration to develop concentration. We practice love to develop love. And, um, and there's a lot of emphasis in traditional Buddhism to practice as a way of developing ourselves, developing capacities that are wonderful. And, but at some point, there's also training. And the distinction that I'm making here is that the word training I'm using to mean that um, we have an activity that we're doing and we're training in that activity. Or to say it maybe, uh, we have a sense, we know something about what this life is about and then we train in that life. But we have to know what that life is about. We have to know what the activity is that's really valuable that we're focusing on here in practice. And so the, um, the practice, many people have logical idea or have some sense or intuition that the Dharma practice is a good thing. And they'll engage in it and they'll practice it and do it. And then at some point, there's a, something happens where there's a clear enough experience of a different way of being a way of being that's maybe characterized, Buddhism likes to characterize it by the language of freedom, characterized by a sense of liberation or freedom. Sometimes it characterizes it by a feeling of profound peace, sometimes by a, pr- a profound feeling of happiness and well being, and sometimes as a clear experience of, of uh, selflessness or lack of selfishness. And, um, and this then becomes a reference point for how practice and train, how training then goes. And they say traditionally in Buddhism, and you don't take it too seriously for yourself, but that it's when a person has an experience or a feeling, personal feeling or experience of freedom, that they, now they know for themselves what the training is about. And until then, practice is partly an act of faith, partly a good idea, or perhaps it's just a nice uh, way of calming down or stress reduction. Nothing wrong with that, but at some point it becomes um, something much more significant. And, um, and the difference between these two are quite a, quite a big difference. Um, and in fact, when people come to practice, it's rare that someone has, sometimes people have an experience of freedom, experience of very profound peace that they've had in life someplace, maybe accidentally, that they do have that reference point before they come in practice. But generally, if we don't have that, then it's hard to know what it is this experience of freedom is like. And why it's hard to have it, to, to know what it's like is that we tend to focus on our lives in a somewhat self-centered way. What's in it for me, myself, and my, my, me and myself, and myself, me, mine, and myself. We're trying to, we have an orientation, it's about my experience, my being safe, my being better, my being successful, my being healed, my being free. And the freedom that uh, Buddhism is pointing towards doesn't really fit into any model of being self-centered, of self-centeredness. It's a little bit like a caterpillar probably doesn't know it's going to become a butterfly when it 
uh, when it forms a cocoon to be in. It can't imagine what it's going to be like, maybe. But then when it comes free of the cocoon, cocoon, it has wings and flies. It has this freedom it could never have imagined when it was still a caterpillar. And so in the same way, it's hard to imagine uh, when we're still a caterpillar, we're still kind of living in what we're taught and oriented to growing up for many of us, a certain kind of self-centeredness in extreme forms, a selfish life. But even people who are not selfish, but who seem kind of actually very generous and kind and supportive of others, they can still be, um, in some ways, maybe a healthy self-centeredness, an orientation from the point of view of how we define ourselves, how we see ourselves as a self. There's a kind of a, the way that we engage and assert ourselves in the world. And in extreme forms, the self-assertion is a self-aggression. And, um, and wanting something, getting something. And this is uh, maybe uh, an interesting distinction between um, um, the kind of freedom that Buddhism focuses on and the kind of freedom that's often popular in in the United States. I think the day after Independence Day and a, a day where, you know, at a time where many people in America are, uh, are insisting that uh, they should be free to do whatever they want and not wear a mask and not have anyone tell them what to do. Um, there's a kind of emphasis, a certain kind of freedom, which at times has been important for this country and at times is a problem. And it's the freedom to do things, the freedom of unfettered activity without any limitations to what we do, uh, to freedom to vote, freedom to assembly, freedom to bear arms, freedom to shop, shop and, you know, in a kind of the kind of the representative of a unfettered freedom to be a consumer is to have an unlimited credit card. Just be able to just you know have that freedom, just to have all our desires met. The uh, freedom that Buddhism talks about is a freedom from the freedom from attachment and clinging, the freedom from hate, the freedom from craving from delusion, a freedom from fear, that it's a freedom from all the ways that we're limited, the way we are uh, restrict ourselves in some way. So if um, you have an open hand, it feels, you know, the hand's been finally opened and relaxed, and the hand is open and feels good to have the hand open. But it feels so good that we want to grasp it As soon as you grasp the open hand, the open hand is lost. And um, so if um, uh, selfishness is like that, that there can be an ease in life, as soon as we want it or appropriate it for ourselves, that there is a contraction that goes on. And we actually lose a certain kind of freedom in the assertion of self, or the aggressive assertion of me and what I want, or, or tightening up. And uh, it's um, kind of like if, um, um, if a person is fairly relaxed, they might, like I said earlier, the diaphragm might be moving freely and nicely, and um, that's very good. Um, but then if we get, uh, you know, we know that the easeful breath, the breathing is very adaptable, very changeable, affected by our mood and activity. That if we get afraid, the breathing change. You can feel the contraction and tightness and the uplifting of the of breathing. And it tends to be a lot of chest breathing, perhaps, sometimes when we're afraid. Anger affects our breathing. Selfishness and wanting and aggressive selfishness affects our breathing. And so the breathing no longer feels relaxed and easeful. There's a contraction, a tightness, a different f- breathing pattern with excessive selfishness. If the people are, if someone is very attentive to the effect, they'll feel how the selfishness has contracted something. 
It might be the chest, the breathing, it might be the shoulders, it might be the jaws, or the, it might be the eyes that are looking in a way and zeroing in or tight or very focused. Or it might be in the brain, the contraction around me, myself, and mine. I, I have to have my way or my way or the highway or kind of like kind of a tightening down or an insistence. That all feels, uh, it's a contraction, it's a limitation. Someone who's very selfish uh, might have be able to assert themselves in the world and have a lot of freedom in action, but they do so at the expense of losing the freedom of their hearts and the mind. But if we're not attentive to that inner life, we won't feel the impact it has. We won't feel how limiting it is and how what a dramatic loss of freedom it is. We won't feel that we like the open hand. We won't notice that the hand has become clenched and therefore there is no more open hand. And so, uh, uh, so as we practice and we begin discovering uh, more and more freedom, one of the things magical, kind of not magical, but very special things that begins happening is there starts to be an orientation or understanding about an, a life which is not self-centered. I like to think of it as being situation-centered, where we're open and very present, very attentive to everything that's here. There's no denial of what's here within us, around us, but there's no contraction, no tightening around it. So as mindfulness works, it's, works, it's, works on us and affects us, and we start feeling, that getting the feedback system of noticing the impact on how we behave, what we do, what we feel, what we want, what we don't want, the impact of our inner dialogue and how it undermines us or limits us, the ways in which desires work or hostilities work within us. And we start feeling more and more the cost, the personal cost for that then um, at some point maybe we start relaxing more deeply, settling more deeply, and, um, and we start kind of getting, going into the cocoon, having been a caterpillar of self for so long. And we don't know, we can't really know how we're gonna come out. And in fact, to know what the practice is about, that I'm supposed to get something, even the idea that I'm supposed to be peaceful, it can be too much. Uh, kind of idea that it's kind of goes along with the old idea of self and it's up to me and uh, uh, measuring yourself how far have I gotten am I have I gotten as far as the person next to me and other Buddhists that I know and all this self game goes on at some point there's a deeper letting go at some point there's some kind of falling away a shedding the kind of more or less traditional idea of this where there is a profound experience of letting go. Well, profound, I don't want to make this uh, strong language today. Uh, there's a deep or <laughs> there's enough experience of letting go that there's a different reference point. Rather than a reference point of self and self-assertion or self-denial or self-protection, there is a reference point of freedom that's available. There's a rest, rest, reference point of some kind of peace that is maybe not so personal. Uh, some time ago, there used to be a lot of discussion about transpersonal psychology. So this transpersonal peace or non-personal peace, it's certainly here, but it's not so easy to associate it with this self. So the open hand, it's hard to find it if the hand is contracted. And to kind of figure out what the, what the open hand is like when the hand is always contracted, you know, we don't have any sense of what it is. But when the hand is finally open, oh, now I know what it's about. Now I know I can keep my hand relaxed. And might still, the habit of contracting might be there. But now the person knows a potential, a possibility, maybe they didn't know before if they spent their whole life contracted. And then the training, the training becomes a training to 
stay with an open hand. Or this training is to realize that, um, yes, they're using, again, the analogy, the diaphragm is relaxed as I breathe. And I know it's possible to be relaxed in my breathing the way I never knew before. And now, let me see if I can let that ease and relaxation spread up into the chest where it's still tight. The training is to expand that relaxation. And it's possible to do that in self-centered ways, let me be the most relaxed breathing person in the, in the, on the block. Or it's possible to just feel that there's a momentum inside, a, a direct, the direction inside that wants to go towards greater freedom. And it's not necessarily a personal thing. It's more like this wants to work on us. This is where the direction that life wants to take. Life doesn't want to be contracted. It doesn't want to be limited. It doesn't want to be, it, life wants to be free. But the freedom of life is not necessarily the freedom to do from the vantage point of self, me and myself and mine, it's the freedom to live from this inner freedom. To live from a place of no craving, no attachments, and even a place where there's a kind of no self there, no self-centeredness at least. And to know what that is like without having experienced it is kind of like the caterpillar trying to figure out what it's like to be a butterfly. Maybe you can't figure it out at all. So at some point in, in this practice of, that we do, at some point there's enough of an experience of this absence of self-centeredness, this peacefulness, this, the mind being at ease, and that we know, oh, this is possible. I had no idea that this kind of inner freedom was possible. And now that I know this is what the practice is about. Now I can train. Now I know what the training is. The training is to live with this peace, this, this freedom. The training, that's the activity of, of uh, freedom. The activity of training is the activity of living from a free place without these, all these inner limitations, limer, inner constrictions that we have. And, um, and then how do we start expanding this place? How do we expand the peacefulness, the ease, the freedom to all the different parts of who we are? It's one thing to have a glimmer or have that door to opened up a little bit. But then uh, what the practice then becomes, the training becomes, is to find out how to expand it more, wider and wider and wider. It's kind of like we have a toehold in freedom. And with that first toehold, then we begin to expand it outwards into all the areas of our life. So, um, and it's not a dramatic, it doesn't have to be a dramatic experience of enlightenment or something that this toehold, there are ordinary experiences in life that can give us a feeling of freedom, the feeling of peace that is what we're training for. So uh, a couple of days ago, my wife and I went for a hike in the mountains, and we spent a few hours next to a, a beautiful, clear little mountain creek with boulders around it and little fish in it. And, and I could just spend, you know, I could have felt like I could have spent the whole day just looking at the pattern of the water uh, flowing over uh, on the surface, flowing down this creek. And there was something uh, very captivating, relaxing, easeful in the clear water, the clear sky, the clear kind of beautiful mountain stream that we're in, peaceful place, that just looking at the stream, um, my, mo my eyes were not tight or zeroed in. <clears throat> my mind was not tight and concerned with any anything. My mind was kind of like floating like the river, kind of floating on the river very peaceful, very at ease, nothing particular, no particular subject of thought that preoccupied me, no preoccupation. Certainly there were thoughts, but everything was very still and quiet and peaceful. Maybe some people have it 
looking at the ocean if they live near the ocean or laying on your back and looking at the clouds above or and it can give a feeling for a kind of a peaceful easeful place that is very meaningful it can provide a deep satisfying feeling of contentment and ease that is a reference point for noticing how we lose it to noticing how we get caught up by things or preoccupied or the mind starts spinning and doing all this stuff. And then remembering that, oh, that's a possibility. That's what, that, that is the place to live from. So in Buddhism, when people start doing the training, they have this reference point. This is worthwhile. This is a valuable place to come. And in fact, sometimes this reference point is so strong that a person realizes that to live any other way is not worthwhile. Any degree of stress, any degree of pushing or aggressive self-selfing, any aggression, any hostility, any craving, any lusting for anything, is just not worth it. There's such a huge loss any selfishness is not worth it. There's, there's a, what's most precious and most valuable is lost in that. That freedom, this profound sense of peace or happiness that can come, it can't be selfish because as soon as we're selfish, we've, we've kind of closed up, the, closed, the, closed the hand into a fist. And to feel that interface between the peace and the tendencies to be selfish again is one of the great kind of challenges of practice, one of the great dances of practice. Because we can't just give up our self-centeredness that easily. But to feel that happening on all the emotions that come, all the lawyers of the mind come and say, well, I'm supposed to be angry or hostile. I'm supposed to want something. And what's wrong with that? You know, what's wrong with having, you know... <clears throat> more things or this and that, I deserve it. And all this stuff that goes on in that meeting place between freedom and where we're not so free. Where we're not so free insists on having a freedom to do, not realizing that it's doing that, we lose the freedom from craving, from selfishness. And so there starts to be this dance, this meeting place. <clears throat> when we start training in Buddhism, we can expect that we're not going to be perfect. We're going to have all kinds of material to look at and be honest about and to work our way through all kinds of attachments and clingings and self selfishness that, we, that operates. And we have this reference point now and there starts to be a dialogue, a meeting place an influence from one to the other. And what the training is to have the influence go from freedom into that place where we're not yet f- completely free. To let the freedom, the peace, the happiness, the love begin to move into those parts of our lives where they're still not there. To help have this kind of selflessness, not self-centeredness. I like not self-centeredness. Um, spread into the rest of our life. And in the process of doing so, to learn that this non-self-centered place, that's the genesis, that can be the origin of how we live in the world, what motivates us, what helps us take care of the world, what helps us take care of this being that's here, ourselves. There's a whole different foundation for choosing how to live our life that's different from the foundation of selfishness. This foundation, it's about me, myself, and mine. It's all about me. It can still be about this being here. You you're, still be about this body, this heart, this mind. But we're no longer self-centered. Now we can be situation-centered. We're, situ- we're at the center of our personal situation. And we're aware of everything here, including what's here in ourselves. 
and we know how to take care of what's in here. We, we, what's in here is as important as any other being out there, any person out there. But we start discovering that to really take care of this being well, we train it, we engage in the training of freedom, the training of non-attachment, the training of non-craving, non-hostility, non-lust, non-craving. So we have a practice that we do and we have a training. The practice is to cultivate these qualities of mind that support us, to cultivate concentration, cultivate mindfulness, cultivate patience, cultivate honesty, cultivate generosity, cultivate kindness and compassion. There's all these qualities that we can cultivate. Um, But then the training is to train in freedom, to train in liberation, to have a uh, a feeling for liberation. And with that feeling of liberation, begin to expand that feeling or that sense or that experience until our life just feels free. And then we'll find that there's plenty of motivation within. Chances are then your life will respond appropriately to what's needed within yourself and the world around you. And the idea of living not selfishly, but living appropriately for the welfare of all beings everywhere, for the welfare of oneself, the welfare of others, the welfare of self and others, and the welfare for the whole world is what the Buddha was talking about. So may your practice bring you to the point where you have, you know what the training is about, what the practice is about. And that's, and then as you, when you really know that for yourself, then they say, the Buddha said, then you become independent in the Dharma. When you have a clear enough reference point for the training, clear enough reference point for freedom, then you become independent in the Dharma because you know now for yourself what it's about. So those are my thoughts for today and on this uh, independence weekend that we that some of us are celebrating and uh, some of us are not. The um, and. Um, but let's always celebrate the possibility of inner freedom. So um, uh, thank you for being here.